Hey guys, welcome. Welcome back to Inner Stage Window, my Saturday stream, which is a conversation with my friends. And as you guys can see, we are having a Sasha episode today. It's Say Sasha. hi, Sasha. Hello, everybody. It's me. Your, your, fa your problematic fave, Sasha. <laughs> Just my fave. <laughs> I'm, all, it's, I'm always so excited for a Sasha episode. <laughs> it's going to be, we know it's going to be spicy if Sasha mm -hmm. is here. That's right. I, I glued eyelashes on for this today, y'all. And they look they so look awesome. Fucking fly. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, um with that being said, Landon, what are we going to talk about today? Tell everybody. We are going to talk about catty women, thus the cat ears. Um no, basically we're going to talk about how uh women turn on each other within the writing industry and really are our worst own enemies within writing books and all of that. So it's going to be mm -hmm. and the complicated nuance to all of that topic and just how terrible it is that we decide to be our own worst enemies. Yeah, this is something that happens a lot in the in the publishing world, in the role play world, in in fanfic and fan art. Pretty much all of those kinds of communities have seem to have this issue. We're going to focus on a few specific stories uh, that happened in, with a lot of um, with the publishing industry. But as we're going through this, you're you're probably going to have flashbacks to your own similar <laughs> situations that have happened in in your friend groups if you hang out with a lot of women, right? Um, so let me say welcome to some people that have popped in here. So welcome, Lunar. Welcome, um, Meta. Welcome, Almanax. Whoever, who is Rar? Whoever Rarf is and Dr. Butts, y'all tell me. I am sure you are from Barber Monger, um, but I'm just not Dr. sure. And Butts welcome, Butts is a stream, is a D and D friend actually that I uh, oh. have persuaded to come. We love okay. You. Yes, Sasha's, you know, Sasha started a, a getting into a D&D campaign a little bit after uh, we started the one that we have both joined Landon's funny enough. <laughs> it's technically a vampire the masquerade campaign so I can make everyone talk about capitalism all the time. Mm. So you know, I'm loving my life. That's Are a good game for that. I am not DMing. Victoria okay. is. Love that. Mm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Vi, for the cat ears. And I think if if I'm correct, um, is it was it Vi the friend that helped you a little bit with the with the script yes. for this, Sasha? Special thank you to Victoria, who sat on the phone with me and chopped it up. So I actually had something of a working thesis for this topic. So love you, babe. <laughs> nice. I also know that it's a really super uh, good episode when we have the idea of a working thesis. I believe <laughs> Karen and I oftentimes just work off of chaos thesis, and this is a working <laughs> one. So, <laughs> well, I think we, I think we like make the outline, and then the thesis emerges from the outline. Is our typical process. <laughs> Absolutely. But you know me, I could talk for like three hours about nothing. So like, we got to have a plan. <laughs> way of doing this. And that being said, like, we do have a lot of content today. Um, so, you know, we're going to be moving kind of fast through this. And I think we should go ahead and get started. So, um, so Sasha, I know that we had like three stories in particular that we wanted to I uh, wanted to focus on for kind of diving into this topic today. So if you could go ahead and, and introduce the topic from your perspective and let's get started on the first one. Oh, thank you so much for subscribing, Meta. Oh, my God. Oh, wait, Lily, that's that's the name you're going by now. I'm so sorry. I called you Meta for so long. Um, Lily, thank you so much for sending me those Bezos bucks. I absolutely love it when you make Bezos spend his money on me. <laughs> <laughs> okay all right so i'm just going to assume that some of you aren't as terminally online as i am i live in this hellscape i breathe the hellscape so but if you are just i don't know somewhat active online one of these stories may have crossed your feet so there's three in 2019 um there is talk about an influencer named carolyn calloway she's like a general pretty white girl taking pictures of herself in flower crowns goes to London I think Cambridge I don't who cares um and there is a piece that comes out in the cut a New York New York magazines the cut section of her former ghostwriter and best friend Natalie Beach being like I was the ghostwriter and here's how Carolyn Calloway was a shitty person to me 
And Carolyn Calloway had kind of already caught flack because she tried to host, I don't want to say like a conference, but like some sort of like in-person meetup where she was completely in over her head. And it was it like bombed. a series of workshops. It was like, it yes, was like, workshops. it was like if somebody, it was, it was like if somebody tried to make like their own convention where they were the only presenter. Yes. A bad, a bad idea. Unless you're willing to hold people hostage for, unless you have a lot of thoughts. Most people don't do not try this. <laughs> so that's the first one that comes out in 2019. In 2020, we see um, the Omegaverse lawsuit write up in the New York times about Addison Kane who is an Omega, a hetero Omegaverse author who sends a bunch of harassing, fraudulent DMCA takedown notices against competitors. And that is like a whole event. And then what got me thinking about this topic where I was like, I, I was like, Karen, I wanna talk about this. <laughs> this year there was Bad Art Friends in the New York Times in which um, two authors are like, we'll say two writers because one of them is like much, We'll say has less traction than the other. Don Dorland uh, is a woman who donates a kidney and creates a private Facebook about it to provide medical updates about her journey. I listen. I know Landon. This is that's going to be my I favorite. Just, topic. I I remember you introducing this topic to me early <laughs> last year, and I was just it blew my fucking mind. Anyway, well, continue. we're we're gonna build up to that one, um, because it, that was the one where me and Sasha actually had some pretty serious disagreements initially. As more information has come out, our our opinions on it have kind of melded together. But um, mm -hmm. it was very it was it was captivating. Yeah, listen, me and Karen were doing the little kitty slap fight for a bit there. But anyway, so <laughs> Don Dorland <laughs> donates a kidney and Sonia Larson is part of the Facebook group. Mm -hmm. She uses Don's life, including a letter that Don publishes on her private Facebook as material for a short story that she publishes, essentially uh, taking down a Don effigy. A Don finds out about this over the course of some years and now there are lawsuits. So when I saw this one, I was like, the girls are always fighting. And I want to think about it. Huh. I wonder why that could be that the girls are always fighting. <laughs> why are the girls like, always fighting? To be that way. It's no. every year. It's literally every year yes. that one of these stories comes out. It's constant. And, then, and every I time I see one, like, I don't know how you guys feel, but um, and I, and I have a, a gender episode. It's really old now, but um, but I have a gender episode where I take like two hours talking about the struggles I've had with my gender, and um, it just always takes me back to how I felt in like my junior and senior year of high school, where I was like, "Girls ain't shit. Girls are so annoying. Fucking, I don't want to have any more friends that are girls, and I freaking hate them." Urgh. And I mean, I I grew up obviously and realized that most women are not like this, and and women are great and and cool, and I really don't have these types of issues. But every once in a while, we like to slip right back into high school mode it's yeah did you know that women are people karen oh my god <laughs> i know and they have like I, multiple kinds of personality i didn't know I actually do, <laughs> either. i'm actually gonna need you to cite your sources on that one um <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure i believe it until a man tells sure me that women not, are people it sounds like there's three people here who had a severe case of not like the other girls syndrome mm, mm -hmm. and then we grew up mm -hmm. so I, mm -hmm. I think mine was less so but that but yes I, I I never was I in my experience never was like anti women it just was that I um went to a very small private school for most of my uh early education in which there were only two women <laughs> or two girls in my class and uh I did not get along with the one other girl so I feel like that that might have had something to do with that that, that would mm. that would literally influence your idea of there literally being like two to three types of women so yeah so for Landon it was true <laughs> Landon, it was it was it, true. All it right, was I very true. <laughs> um, however, <laughs> as soon as I went to the all girls Catholic school freshman year, uh, that was a one eighty. So <laughs> as soon as that happened, it was like, okay, well, we're gonna just figure it out that they're every person is a different person. Who knew? Mm. <laughs> Shock and awe. 
Yep. So all three of these stories, um, Sasha is going to go a little bit deeper into each of them um, as we go through this. Deep dives have been done on a lot of these. So we're going to keep coming back mostly as we talk to what they have in common and kind of what that means um, for uh, our, our online spaces and our creative spaces. So that's really what we're going to be aiming to do here is to kind of try to see like, why why this is like this yearly cycle and why we keep coming back to this and and how these stories are really the same story being manufactured over and over and over and i think it's important to note that it's that while this is like a big think piece on in new york times and big lawsuits and stuff like that this happens more than yearly it's constantly in our in our magazines and constantly in this like in the in the world of of media presence of women tearing down other women Mm -hmm. um it's but yeah this focus of the cycle of new york times getting involved in it instead of you know the normal people magazines yeah it it lends it a veneer of legitimacy Mm -hmm. like when you have um and especially because most of these pieces these are very long pieces um and i will say on pretty much all of these topics like okay so there's an initial article And then in my spare time, I've read up a bit more, like I've either listened to podcasts or I've like found additional blogs and essays on these things, which is why I'm, you might hear me say things where you're like, I don't remember that being part of the original narrative. And it's because it wasn't. (laughs) (laughs) That's also a thing here, is that the complete rewriting of history. Especially especially with my girl, Don Dorland. So, but we'll, we'll get there everyone's gonna get to hear about how I feel about that but let's start with uh let's start with um Carol and Calloway yep so this was the 2019 story so it was a little while ago so the memories are probably a little fuzzier on this one um so so Sasha take us through it what what happened with Caroline Calloway like what was her deal well right about the time that Carolyn Calloway's workshop stopped crashing and burning or start crashing and burning um, this piece in the cut comes out by, as said, her friend is named Natalie Beach. Uh, Natalie basically reveals that she was um, good friends with Carolyn Calloway. Oh yeah, yes, please bring bring up that picture. Everybody, I want you to enjoy the picture says a thousand words of look at this, like poor put upon little goth girl with beautiful blonde Carolyn Calloway in her white top and her blue jeans. Like this is a picture that honestly tells you exactly what to think and feel before you read anything else about this. Like you have have been psychically compromised game over but let's play so Natalie is basically like we met I think at NYU and um they go on a vacation to Europe together and Natalie starts to um help write captions for Carolyn's posts like Carolyn is basically starting to be an Instagrammer she's taking a bunch of pictures um Natalie is is helping her out a lot of this article is actually about their friendship and it's part of it's a I don't know it's weird because you know a lot of times we can be hurt in our personal lives by other people's behavior but sometimes that's just due to the nature of like I don't know human complexity and the fact that living with other people automatically means sometimes they want different stuff Sometimes you don't advocate for yourself. Sometimes you make sacrifices that you later regret. Like sometimes, you know, it, and it sounds like a lot of this is Natalie is kind of making sacrifices for a friend that kind of enchants her and impresses her. And later she comes to resent this, especially with Carolyn Calloway's like rise to popularity, mm-hmm. which I know like that's a human feeling. But, yeah. uh, anyway. And throughout throughout this time, something to make sure that it's clear is that Caroline Calloway was clearly like popular girl vibes, but she wasn't like real popular girl. Like she didn't have that behind her when they first started becoming friends. And then as her Instagram grew, then she became like a real, tr- an actual popular girl. So, you know, it's kind of like Natalie knew her before she was big. So there's some stuff going on with that, too. Well, and there's mm-hmm. some entitlement in I helped you get there. And not, yes. and not receiving any of that back and, and, or in the way that she wishes she was. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so interesting thing about this, because I didn't catch this on my first read, first read, but um, basically because what this is all about, like the core of it is, is that like Carolyn Calloway 
is putting out this personality via her Instagram captions. And actually I am that personality and I haven't been compensated is kind of the implication. Well, fun fact, in this article, um, Natalie, on their way back from Europe, Natalie misses two non-refundable flights and she's broke. A Carolyn Calloway, rich girl Carolyn Calloway, uh, sits on the floor of the airport and goes through her parents' credit cards and buys Natalie's plane tickets back. And, mm -hmm, and yes. Yeah, so like... Yep. And this was after a very unfortunate um, romantic slash sexual encounter um, in, during that Europe trip too. So Natalie is already feeling like down in the dumps when she's having this like plane flight drama going on. And Natalie volunteers to um, ghostwrite or continue ghostwriting um, for Carolyn's post um, to compensate for the these like, you know, last minute, super expensive plane tickets. So I caught that and I was like, wait, 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 wait a second. Like there was like an agreement there. And then um, Natalie's like, okay, I'm done doing this. And Carolyn, Cal Carolyn keeps going and, I don't know, writes her own captions from there on out and continues her rise to stardom. And just Natalie completely resents this. <laughs> That's what it is. It's a big article of resentment. resentment. Yes, yeah. this, is, this, is, this is 100 percent resentment of a friendship that has fallen apart. Mm -hmm. And a woman who feels like that they have sacrificed uh, more than they wanted to because it led to success of another person. Mm -hmm. um, and just the resentment of built up for years. And you can, again, you can kind of, like you were saying, you can kind of see it even in the photo that like, there's a stark difference of what they look like, of how they were raised. Um, mm -hmm. There's this constant idea of competition that Natalie has kind of projected back on their friendship. Like there's a mm -hmm. section of the article that's talking about how Natalie was, grew up in Yale as a townie and how Caroline always wanted to go to Yale. And so like, that was a set that like, wasn't, a competition but it was kind of still a competition and that's been the just subtly thrown in there it's the whole narrative is definitely based around like who is the real victim who is the real good girl who is the real woman and while purportedly this is about um like the veneer of this is like authenticity right it's like Karen Lee Calloway has presented herself inauthentically and her whole brand is around being authentic and so this is a brand criticism but really what it is is like friendship gone wrong angry and I will tell you this so after this I like I don't not sure if the poster's still there I didn't check but like Carolyn Calloway had all these like super sad Instagram posts up because she knew this article was coming out and it was honestly like I'm an empathetic person. So for me, it was like painful to read this because just like, I don't know, like everyone's like, oh my gosh, Natalie, like Regina George just totally tricked you into writing captions for her. Oh my God. And like poor, <laughs> poor Carolyn Galloway is just like, I so like clearly so badly wants to like talk to this person and have some sort of closure or apology. And it just knows that she's going to have her ass handed to her. And it's, like, emotionally devastating. And, after, like, this begins, like, the true wave of Carolyn Calloway hatred, which is something that, by the way, if you Google her name, you will find Carolyn Calloway written about periodically from this moment more seriously. Like, is she a scammer? Is she not a scammer? Like, people constantly uh, debating her worth, et cetera, and it's like it's it's really grim. Well, well, I'll tell you what happens to Carolyn Calloway later because we got it. I we got to hit two more summaries in twenty minutes. Um, but also, <laughs> I just also wanted to point out it's an interesting take a look at uh, from a two thousand twenty two perspective of a two thousand nineteen situation that it's like there this particular thing uh, as far as like accusing someone on Instagram of being fake. Uh, would not happen, I think, to the extent of which it happened in 2019, even though it was only three years ago, because everyone is kind of accepted after this point that everyone on on Instagram is fake. Like, it's it's an interesting 
change that has happened. This was, yeah, this was definitely one of the early ones. And I think another point in this story that I want to make sure we, we bring up in the summary section um, is that it's pretty obvious from the way that Natalie portrays towards the end of their friendship is that Caroline was having a lot of her own issues that really have nothing to do with Natalie. Um, maybe a little bit to do with Instagram. It's kind of hard to tell. But she gets into some drugs, potentially prescription, potentially illegal. It's a little unclear. Um, and, uh, and, and if it, if you've ever been somebody that turned to, to drugs or alcohol when you're sad, you know, that just makes it worse. So I'm sure that there's a lot of decisions and things that Caroline did during that time that, um, that later on she, she ends up regretting quite a bit. Hence all of the sad posting on Instagram. Yes. God, it yeah. Was, it was really just like, yeah. relatable. Yeah, and just bringing this idea of a personal friendship into the mass media on a, I think that this was on the cut, correct? Yeah, so the on cut. A, this one was on a fairly the cut. reputable like news site mm-hmm. and treating it like fact rather than treating it like an opinion piece or a or a personal or a personal essay. Well, um, even even when you read it, like it does seem like Natalie's telling just her side of the story, but this is the internet, yeah. and that's not how we take it, and it this just amplifies, you know. Yeah. That's and not it, how stories, that's not how life really works, I think, to yeah. some degree. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So we're going to, we're going to, um, as Sasha said, we're going to come back to all of these, of course, but I think that's a pretty good summary on, on what happened between Caroline and Natalie, at least from what the public knows. Um, so, so let's talk next about, uh, my favorite, <laughs> give a good summary of my favorite one, which is all about Het Omegaverse. Um, <laughs> So, something you probably didn't know existed, but it does. The, kid, the kidney one is a pretty close second. Uh, <laughs> kidney, kidney is might be my kidney is my favorite. Okay, so uh, <laughs> I'm very sorry for what I'm like. Um, this is your not safe for work moment. If you just want to skip what I'm about to say, like two minutes ahead, go ahead and do that now. So I'm about to tell you what Omegaverse is. But we also yeah. know that if you're listening to this, if you're listening to this uh, stream, you you probably already know what it is. But yeah. continue are, on. Are, you, are, you had to click the 18 me. plus thing to get into this chat. So, you listen, know. <laughs> people who know me at this point have been forced to listen to like a lot of my internet shenanigans and they know I'm into like gross anime. You're not emotionally prepared, Victoria, because you can't be. Anyways, so Omegaverse is a invented genre um, where there are basically three genders, alpha, beta, and omega. Um, that is also a social hierarchy. Omegas are the breeders, betas are like your average Joe workers, and the alphas are the fertilizers. That is the most polite way that I can explain it to you. Um, and in Omegaverse, um, you can be a male omega and give birth. I'm not gonna, we're not gonna get into like how that works because that is an ongoing debate. Um, it's, it's been suspend your belief. Yeah, <laughs> you're just, you're just gonna have to understand that this genre exists as a, as a way, um, typically in fanfic, although there's quite a lot of published Omegaverse as well, um, for a way to play around with gender that's not realistic so that, um, you know, that you can kind of express things that you might think or feel or, or think or, or be horny about, um, without what using real life gender. What do you mean? What do you or- mean? It's about gender. <laughs> it's about being horny. Okay. This is all about being horny. Like, no, I it's, hey, your wise. it's also <laughs> about letting your queer. Wise. It's also about letting queer as uh, queer relationships ride the relationship escalator that is expected upon us. So yeah. that is an important part of the Omegaverse too. <laughs> but it's also it is, but it is but it is <laughs> very nobody, very nobody horny. Nobody cares about that. Nobody cares about I, I care about that. <laughs> okay. No, I, anyway, I, I, I explained but, the megaverse to my therapist. So like, if you want to like, she, and she laughed so hard, she had to cover her mouth uh, because <laughs> she was losing her shit. Okay. Anyways, so the, all you need to know is that the Omegaverse exists. There's a, a lot of um, self-publishing because it's in the romance genre. Um, mm-hmm. And one particular author whose uh, nom de plume is Addison Kane. Um, she starts basically in order to get ahead um, on Amazon, starts issuing these DMCA takedowns. A special fact about Addison King, though, I think she has drunk her own Kool Aid because there is, like, of course, something strategic about taking down like potential competition. But like Addison King, like, truly believes in her heart that even though she's writing 
um i shit you not bane fan fiction with the serial numbers scrubbed off she believes that like she has a deeply original core that other people are stealing from and what happens is she eventually sends a dmca takedown to the wrong person who decides to fight her um and it, this legal battle actually ends up in federal court um if you want to hear more about this i highly recommend the a lab podcast episode about it and you can listen to old lawyer men read like legal briefs about omega verse which personally adds years to my life um but after this after this too so there's a new york times piece that comes out about this uh then youtuber Lindsay ellis unrelated to zoe ellis the uh the author that responds to addison kane she makes a youtube video about this whole situation Addison Kane then attempts to DMCA take down Lindsay Ellis's video, leading to a second Lindsay Ellis video in which she goes on even more about this. And of and, course, and both you know, of those. So I just want to say, as an aside, but if you're interested in this, those two Lindsay Ellis videos are some of her best work ever, and I highly recommend you go just go watch them. Like they're excellent. They they absolute they are great. They are really good. And super funny um, because I love reading legal documents, don't you? Anyways, so <laughs> I in fact uh, don't. <laughs> well, you probably also don't like to read finance newsletters, and you know, <laughs> we're just two very different people, and I love you for it. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, so um, here, here's an interesting thing about this: is that like New York Times is kind of like we'll say one level of distribution. I actually subscribe to the New York Times. Look at me. Um, but then YouTube is like a whole other distribution platform. So like if even if you're a person who kind of like wasn't big into the news when the Lindsay Ellis video blows up, like every like there's there's millions of views on this Lindsay Ellis video, or at least a million. It's in like the one point something millions. Um, I can um, go check. So it's- and I'll post in the chat. That one's wickety wild. And that one's a bit shorter. Um, but we'll t again, once again, I'll tell you what happens with Addison Kane. I Googled all these people. I know where they are now. All right, it's time for my favorite. It's time, it's time, it's time. <laughs> all right. It's time guys. All right, so we're gonna take we're gonna take probably a little bit longer explaining this one because this one goes deep and this one actually divided people. People really did not agree when this first came out. Unlike these first two stories, where the internet basically agreed and they were just dunking on um, on whoever the villain particular villain person was. Um, but this one really divided people. People had serious uh, different opinions. By the way, the first um, Omegaverse has almost three million views. It's two point nine. And then the second Omegaverse video has a little over 3 million views. So that is that is 3 million plus people that um, she introduced this story to most likely. Yes, so she, she had, she spread this. She spread this big time. Okay, all right. So here, here is the story called, Who is the Bad Art Friend? Which Landon, can you bring up the, um, the, this yeah this one look at this it. once again i just want to point you to like the illustration that's kind of chosen for this because i always find the pictures to be very suggestive the omega first one is just kind of like a generic wolf thing which is why i didn't really reference it but like this picture of like a person i don't know i forget what this thing is called but under like this, the bell like, jar specimen, uh, but yeah this person under the bell jar um very evocative yeah, the picture is rough. Okay, so here's here's the story. And here's the thing with this New York Times piece that I'm gonna point out right away. The New York Times piece does um, some timeline rearranging and most follow-up pieces on this uh, repeat certain things that are either unverified or like somewhat misrepresented. And this is gonna be important because um, I'm going to give you like the initial New York Times read, and then I'm going to give you some sweet facts. Um, long story short, Don Dorland is some kind of cringy yoga -y white lady who decides to anonymously donate a kidney. She makes a Facebook group to provide people with updates about her journey. Um, when she doesn't get kind of like the accolades that she's expecting for this, um, and especially she notices that one person, Sonia Larson, is looking at all her posts, but never commenting. She approaches Sonia about it and is like, well, hey, what's up? And Sonia is like, no, no, we're, we're buds. It's cool. 
Um, yeah, I know it sounds cringe, Annika, but don't worry. I'm about to come <laughs> It's super I'm... cringe, but but don't worry. It gets better. <laughs> Listen, I am here to protect every cringy white lady. You have the right <laughs> to be embarrassing, okay? <laughs> so, um... No, it's your embarrassment, though. But and Sasha, yeah, and while Sasha tired. is doing this, I'm just going to, because this is such like a, a juicy girl story, I'm just going to enjoy some Girl Scout cookies here made with the freshest of girls because Dawn and Sonia are both the freshest of girls. They are so fresh. <laughs> okay. So here's, here's what happens. Maybe this could have just been a like, why don't you like my posts kind of thing, which, you know, is a question we ask our friends sometimes. I don't, I don't care, but you know, other people do this. So uh, but one day, <laughs> a friend sends Dawn this, like, um, link or something, like, oh, uh, or, like, basically tips Dawn off and is like, I think Sonya wrote a story about you. Um, and then either Dawn, like, I don't think she finds a cop uh, copy online. And at first, she, like, declines to even, like, get into this. But eventually, when she finds out that Sonya is going, this that Sonya's story has been picked to like circulate for some sort of book event, she gets into it, and she totally finds out that it is 100% a story about her, including quotes from a, a letter she posted to her private group, and, <laughs> and then it goes down, um, and that is when, <laughs> actually, oh, so this is the New York Times claims that, um, that Dawn sues to stop this story going forward, which I later find out. <laughs> I don't think that is the case or like, it's it's weirder than you think. So I think Dawn is basically just like, uh, what? <laughs> um, and then it becomes lawsuit battle with the ladies. The New York Times piece does some timeline rearranging, as I said, in order to make Dawn seem like this person who imagined a friendship with Sonya completely in her head, um, is super entitled about wanting attention. And then essentially, Sonia Larson is a woman of color. And then essentially like bullies this more successful woman of color into submission. And once again, like I just an aside about the power of what you choose to include in a story um, is that some of Sonia Larson's like previous pieces containing basically like a self inserty kind of character um, some of those storylines are included in the New York Times piece in order to kind of paint Sonia as this kind of like social justice person who's like engaging with, with narratives around white supremacy. And, and therefore Dawn does get reflected upon as this like, you know, white crusader who's trying to control any criticism of whiteness. Which only could, is only true if you rearrange the order in which they suit each other. Yes, this yeah. is important. <laughs> It is important. And because... this is the first original narrative I had heard as far as the white savory mm -hmm. as aspect of all of this. Yeah. Yes. And, and as somebody who tends to be more of a Sonia than a Dawn, somebody that tends to be on the end where I realize someone likes me more than I like them. Um, I was like, basically team Sonia. I was like, you know, Sonia got really crazy at the end. And I wouldn't personally want to be friends with Sonia. I think she ended up doing some really crappy stuff. The first several things are like totally not her fault. Like that was my position. Oh, man, that was wrong. Because if you get to the actual timeline, they are both just like not right. <laughs> and Sonia is really, really terrible. Yeah, really but then this is how it was painted yeah. in the New York Times bestselling, which you would think would be like what people assume is a replicable, uh, rep nope, can't say that word, which is a honest and trusting website and uh, newspaper that you would think would write accurate articles. Turns out. Yeah. I, I didn't, I mean, yeah. I didn't think it was a lie. I've known some Don Dorlins in my life. I thought this sounds plausible. Sure. Yeah. I definitely working in not like working in nonprofit circles, working in in um yeah especially overseas. I have met plenty. You've met of some dons. <laughs> uh, so reading this and being painted this and sitting there and being like, okay, yeah, I could totally understand that this woman is butthurt about the fact that someone is critiquing her maybe biasism and her own racist experiences and as she's not checking her white privilege at the door and I can 100% hear all of this uh, because that's how it was painted. Yep. And yep. Uh, upon further reflection, while some of that is true and valid, 
It's not uh, true the way the New York article yeah. Times article makes it seem. It's really no, not. There's, there's some valid val there's some valid thoughts in like the way that she phrased things and the way that she probably approached this anonymous donation and everything like that. However, as far as the facts go and the way that everything went down, um, the, it's certainly not she she was villainized far more than she should have been. Yeah. So yeah. Sonia, so so Sasha, give us the real Dawn and Sonia timeline. Yeah. Okay. And listen, I just want to just important caveat here. Please go and criticize white supremacy. Yes. Everybody yeah. should be doing that. That is a thing that everybody should be thinking about and everybody should be doing. Uh, if you're a white person, you should be internally criticizing that all of the time and externally. Like, this is good. And I don't want it to be like, you know, oh, you know, you, you can criticize white supremacy until you hurt a white lady's feelings because people can survive hurt feelings and having your feelings hurt is just a normal part of life, especially when you're challenging narratives of supremacy. So let's just make that explicit here. Yes. Um, but <laughs> that was not the narrative that that, that is not actually, <laughs> this is the problem. The problem is, is that um, Sonia Larson is actually nuts and she gets painted as a, a victim of supremacy when really she's just a victim of her own hubris. <laughs> and that is shitty. <laughs> that is shitty because there's a lot of really legitimate criticisms that exist and like really real cases of people being tormented uh, by white supremacy. So like using her as this person who gets owned by it when she's a self owner, anyways, um, rough timeline is that they are like, we'll say in the same literary circles. Um, Dawn thinks they're friends. Sonia kind of thinks no. Um, Dawn makes a very small Facebook group. Basically imagine like if you were pregnant or something or you were going through some other major surgery and you wanted to share like private updates with like a small group, like that's what this is. Yeah, it's um, only like, it's only at the top. <laughs> at the biggest that this group ever gets, it's like 60 people ever. That's yeah. the most that ever get in there. It's literally just like her coworkers and family. Like that's we it. Which again yeah. is not what the picture that is painted in the New York Times. Yeah, mm -hmm. in the article, it makes it seem like there's like hundreds of people in this group and it's literally everyone Dawn knows, but that's just not true. Yeah. It's not. Um, so then um, Facebook analytics shows that Sonia is looking at all of these posts, which like is a weird thing. Have you ever had like an ex or someone who's like looking at all of your Instagram stories or like liking your stuff but refuses to text you back? Yes. It's weird. So like <laughs> Tom is also not weird for noticing this. And, and she reaches out and is like, hey, like I see you're in this group and you look at stuff, but you don't like engage do you not want to be here like is this not your thing because if it's not like you don't have to and tanya's like no 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 no, girl we're buddies we are friends mm -hmm. um, and remember at this time dawn really does think they're truly good friends and sonia doesn't like dawn and has done nothing to communicate this to yes, dawn whatsoever nothing. nothing in fact she's actively lying to dawn's face when dawn brings this up which yep. is also i think a universal woman uh experience as yep. far as I think all of us have been in friendships where the other person directly lies to our face about how they feel about us. Yeah, and I, I have to admit, girl, like, I've been in Sonia's position where girl. I said the kind of things Sonia said, and I'm like, no, 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 it's cool. Like, I like you. And then the truth is that I really don't. But what I don't do is some of what Sonia does next. That it's truly yes. awful. Yes. And I do have to say, I think we've all been in the position where someone has lied to us about how we feel. And we mm -hmm. also lied about how we are feeling about something. Yeah. That is a universal thing i think in girl world yes yep. i think it's a universal thing in people world where you're just trying to like and, and to go along to get along but this is another thing that like sonia is not just going along to get along as we're about to find out so anyways um in 2015 sonia begins to work on a short story called the kindest um, where a white savior uh, donates her kidney. And in this, um, in this piece, there is a letter from the white savior, savior kidney donator. And it is pretty much ripped from Dawn's letter, like straight up. Like if you're gonna do this kind of thing, reader, watcher, if you're gonna steal and riff on real people you know, Try to be a little more subtle than this. I have been caught Sonia Larsening before. Um, you're never as smart as you think you are. 
Um, and Sonia Larson just self owns in a way that is so massive. It's almost like I can't even under, I cannot understand why you would do this because it is so easy for Dawn to see literally her exact language from the there are sentences that are verbatim, literally. Are, it's that it's verbatim. <laughs> it's bad. Plagiarism. Yeah. And like, think about it. And we're, we're mostly like role players and fanfic writers here. I know that's mostly my audience. So let's like take it from our perspective. If you've been in a, in a role play group and you know someone doesn't like you and they make their character not like you, you have never been in that situation and not known what's going on and seen them doing it. So like, you know, if Dawn ever found this and it is inevitable that Dawn eventually would, Sonya should have known like it would be super obvious and there's so many ways she could have fixed this like why'd she have to make it a kidney donation why'd she have to put in the letter why couldn't she made it a phone call instead you know etc etc and it was just like it just blows my mind how blatant this was yeah it's like joining an rp group and realizing that someone has made a character who is you with Mm -hmm. your name with your experiences and things that you've given up in group chats like crazy like well Mm within her right artistic right sure but also like crappy human being. Exactly. Yeah. Just be listen, <laughs> like as far as like whether you can do this, like as a creative, sure you can, but also maybe you're a bad person doing this. I don't know. Anyways, so here's okay, also here's the thing. I'm gonna kind of skip forward. Um, Sonia is gonna be the one who initially sues Dawn. And it is this is okay, self massive self own again by Sonia. This is incredible. Because Sonia sues Dawn, um, she has to present um, material supporting her lawsuit. Do you want to know what that includes? It includes a fuck ton of private messages between Sonia and her friends where Sonia is literally like, yuckety duck duck, I am stealing this shit from Dawn. I think Dawn is the cringiest bitch alive. Like, like literally, it's just like you want to know what I'm gonna do. I come. I'm gonna commit some crimes against this person that I think is annoying. Like, all right, all right, that's what we're doing. So, and again, this is something that happens because of the lawsuit Sonia initiates. So, just imagine that you're like, you want to know what I want to do? Embarrass myself more. Like that's. It's like. Not quite Addison K levels of entitlement, but impressive. And, um, and Sasha, so- can you can you also because I, I think I remember this, so correct me if I'm wrong. What the lawsuit was about was because Dawn was showing up at some of these events where that Sonia was at, or what was the, the initial not lawsuit about? Not yet. So what? Ha- okay. So what happens? I've got the article up. Okay. So one of um one of the friends, a mutual friend. Um, tells Don about what's happening. D- uh, Don hears that there's going to be um, an audible recording of this story, um, and she does not want to have the letter included. Don confronts Sonia um, be about this. I think what year are we in now? We are in 2018 ish about this time. And then um, she finds out that about a year after the email exchange where Sonia deny or is kind of icy to her, she finds out that this story was published without a paywall on the website of, an Ameri- of American short fiction. She reads it and then um, she gets, she's fucking pissed. Um, so then um, Dawn writes to the, the website of American short fiction and is like, this includes plagiarized material. Um, she That's files right. a copyright, and she files a copyright letter on her original lawyer, um, or, or on she files a copyright on her original letter, and then so because of that, sense. and because of that, it was disqualified, right? Like it could, yes, yeah. Because of that, it's disqualified from One City One Story, which is an anthology published by the Boston Book Festival. Um, mm-hmm. Don does threaten big damages, but you know, I'm kind of like she she's mad. The festival organizers spend money trying to defend themselves, but Don is just fucking pissed. Yep. Uh, so at she, this point, at this point, Don is going off talking shit, but she yes. isn't really doing anything. But yes. Yeah, so, and, and here's and the goal is to get it so that the work cannot continue to be published and recognized. Yes. In, yes. The, in the circles in which it's being rewarded. Yes. And, and okay. Yeah. I don't want to get too far down the legal yeah. hole here, but I want to point out that Don is going after where this piece is being published. 
She mm-hmm. is not going after Sonya personally. She just doesn't want this like piece of plagiarism and frankly like humiliating piece of fiction that seems to have caused her to lose esteem um, in the eyes of her friends and peers. She just doesn't want that circulating, which like fair. So, um, so, but she is not going after Sonya. It is Sonya who sues Dawn for what's called torturous interference, which is basically like you're fucking with my money. And that is where the lawsuits come up. So Sonya sues first, and that is when a lot of stuff starts coming out in subpoenas. And now basically both of these women are kind of tra- uh, trapped in some ways in these, in these like legal battles because both of them have now like sunk money into lawyers and they're both hoping to win their civil suits because if you win your civil suit, you can accl- include your attorney's fees um, in your winnings. So I think at this point, it's less about the actual winnings or like actual money because Sonya doesn't really make any money off her story, like maybe 400 bucks. Yeah, I'm looking for it in the article. It's like 400 and something dollars that Mm -hmm. she makes. But the lawyers, lawyers are money. But anyways, Mm -hmm. once you kind of um, roll the timeline out, you realize that Sonya kind of spends years making her bed and Dawn tries to avoid this story completely. Like she hears about it from a friend before and then dismisses it, doesn't engage with it. It is only when she find, like, finds out that this is gonna be like included in an anthology that is distributed to a city that she finally takes it upon herself to investigate. Yeah. So, you know, for a person that is purportedly like a huge egotist as is painted in the initial New York Times story, like if she's so self-obsessed, why does it take her so long to actually investigate um, this story that is supposedly about her. Like, the truth she, is more complicated. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like she's nice. So anyways, I read this story and I immediately was like, what the fuck, Dawn gives up a kidney. Like, I'm sorry, but I sense massive writer insecurity because like, I don't know, as a creative, sometimes you're like, is the fact that I'm generating thoughts from my brain as vital as if I was out like, I don't know, like digging wells for people who need water. You're like, is the work that I'm doing like actually valuable and would I be better served by doing something more material? And so Dawn kind of does like a big thing that I think triggers that writer insecurity. Like, you know, Sonia is out here trying to write about things that she feels are important to her where she has like um, a morally gray character of color that she uses as a vehicle to critique, you know, the idea of the perfect of color, so to speak. And that's good. That's important to her. And that definitely has meaning. But it it seems to me that when faced with like this large material thing from Dawn, that is so threatening that she has to like gossip about it with all of her friends and like elevate Dawn's choice to like a point of literary critique in order to diminish it. And well, that's me. <laughs> I think I think also like a part of this is that she projected something onto Dawn, mm-hmm. created a character, and then expected Dawn to be that character. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. the New York Times ran with that character. They weren't writing about Dawn. They were writing about the character in the in the novel, in the short story that she wrote. Because yep. that is how she viewed Dawn. Like she had like, yeah, it's this whole. Sonia had projected so much onto somebody else and then sold that perspective to everybody else. Yeah, and Mm -hmm. what blows my mind the most about this story is there's so many points in this story where it could have been resolved a lot more amicably. And if you go through them, like I'm gonna list them and what you're gonna notice is every single one of these points is within Sonia's control not Dawn's. And that's what swung me around to like, oh crap, I was tricked by this New York Times article. You know, Sonia is really, is really awful. And yes, Dawn is cringy and annoying. And I think like, you know, perpetuating the legal battle back and forth, that was really bad. And, um, you know, I, I, I definitely am not a fan of people that constantly want to talk about the awesome thing that they did. You know, it's, it's annoying. Sorry. If, you know, if that's offensive, it just, it's just true. It's just annoying, but that doesn't make it I yeah. am offended. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> not liking a person and a yeah. person being a terrible person. Yeah, like, so like here's there are like so many points. There's like so many points, right? Like Sonia could have easily communicated to Dawn that they weren't as close of friends as Dawn thought they were. And I know that's very we're hard to all. do. We're not friends. <laughs> 
<laughs> she just could have. And it, when wow. when Dodd confronted her about not liking the post, she could have said, "Oh my gosh, you know, I really appreciate you coming to me to say this. I I am actually not uncomfortable with the Facebook group. Can we just be friends outside the Facebook group? You know." So there's another point Sonia could have totally like made this go away. Um, when her when her catty group of of friends that she was group chatting all about Dawn with are constantly pointing out that like this story is literally about Dawn, you know, duh. And, and when you look through some of the messages that are published, like, yes, a lot of the friends are also dunking on Dawn, but they're also pointing out that like, you gotta, you need to edit this some more, <laughs> you know? And she could have totally done that. She could have made the book like the same idea, but like not about a kidney donation, about some other charitable Liver act. Donation. She could have, like, yeah, go, something, yeah, anything, the fucking organ. you know, go, going and building, okay wells in africa whatever and i don't, don't know and don't play and don't plagiarize the, the letter like make it a phone call instead of a letter there problem solved like there's so many points where sonia could have like done this or just not publish the story just write about something else or, or <laughs> if the story was inspiring fine if this is something that like fiction like that inspired the writer in her absolutely and I think that there is a level where this story needs to be told because the character she created is an accurate character and the themes that she wanted to talk about were accurate themes mm -hmm. the it's just not dawn <laughs> so close to the source material that the person who inspired the event found out about it and then she did nothing to change it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she, not, it she instead took her fiction and made it into thinking it was reality. Mm -hmm. Listen, I have, again, I have Sonia Larson people and been caught doing it and have had to explain myself. I have also been Don Dorland and have read something that is about me and had somebody lie to my face about it. Um, and you know what? I, I don't hold it against the person who... Um, who signed me, so to speak, because it was super funny. Um, but, <laughs> well, <laughs> like, it was a thing. But they you, also you weren't trying to publish it, it okay? They well, weren't trying to yeah. publish that story. Well, there's yeah. also this idea that, like, we as people and human beings, like, w if you are that kind of person who wants to be someone's muse, to inspire love letters and love stories oh, and all the wonderful things. Fire. Then you uh -huh. have to. Then you have to also accept the fact. The reality is, if things are inspiring love, things things are also going to inspire hatred and or and just, distaste and dislike. Just, and you have to accept both of those things. There's no inherent purity in creative acts. No. Okay. All right. There. There's no inherent purity. Okay. All right. So I know we we've been slightly over. So what do these stories all have in common? That's okay. I kind of assumed we were going to run over today. I was like looking at this outline. There's no way. <laughs> Listen, I'm trying. I'm trying to keep it. You're doing story. so good. Sasha. You're doing good. You're doing good. So yeah, what what do all three of these stories have in common? What what are what are the things? I Women. <laughs> as as Beastie Boys would like to tell you, do 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 girls, yeah. girls. <laughs> Girls, but it, but it's not only girls, it's girls who are actively just trying to destroy each other, or as Sasha so eloquently pulled it in her notes, pushing each other down the stairs. Pushing <laughs> each other down the stairs. It is, it's, yeah. not, it's not even just that there are two women involved and there's a rivalry. It is literally that one person is trying to undersell and undercut another mm -hmm. for their own success or own feelings. And that's yeah. correct, Annika. All I really want is girls. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and that's probably that why I amazing? spent all of this time Googling about these people outside of the initial articles. Like everyone mm -hmm. else read the stories, like had their takes. Uh, as an aside, Karen mentions that with the initial Don Dorland thing, um, she is Team Sonia. I would like yeah. everyone to know that in my personal server, when I come upon the story, everybody is Team Sonia. And I come out of a hole. <laughs> and be like, What's up? I'm Team Dawn, and everyone's like, "Fuck you!" And I'm like, no, actually, you're that's what happened. Say. No, that is totally what happened. We were all like, "Wow, Dawn is so annoying and cringy." Wow, what the heck? And then Sasha comes in, like, "No, Dawn's not that cringy, guys," and I'm gonna prove it. And then, like, a few weeks later, she literally proves it, and we we're all like, "Oh, okay. Well, I guess they're both shit. Sorry." <laughs> And Sonya is truly terrible because she's the one that has the power during this entire situation. Yeah. You know what? So, you know what? Is it the best to be cringy? No, but like, is it the worst? No, it's, it's not the worst. People are cringy okay. no matter what. 
<laughs> all right. So, and and so, yeah. All these women, they are all taking each other down. But then it's also, these are very literary depictions of personal vendettas, and yeah. they are florid embellishments of dry legal proceedings. Well, I said, I'm the person who, like, wants to go and read the actual court documents, because first of all, they're <laughs> hilarious. And second of all, because... I'll, I think, I don't know, a lot of time, some journalists skim legal proceedings because they think they're boring too. Um, and they will kind of take a summary and embellish or they like do not clarify a timeline. And if you don't clarify the timeline or the facts of the matter, the story that you present isn't going to be accurate. Um, and a, like basically the cut piece with um, with Natalie is pure narrative. Um, the the Omega verse piece is also kind of a little flimsy on the exact timeline because it like um, like the later piece with Bad Art Friend it's flipping back and forth across time in order to present in order to like build the narrative and build emotion and while yeah. that is nice for like a book uh, that is not how real life works and when you do that you kind of obscure the truth and so mm -hmm. both of these pieces involve obfuscation of critical timelines in order to make a narrative more cohesive yep and that's why i recommend really for the omegaverse that's why i really recommend watching um lindsay ellis's video because it does a much better job at clarifying what things happened during the timeline because she took the new york times article plus everything else that had been written about this and kind of synthesized it um just reading the new york times article for even though like Oh my God, Addison Kane is bonkers. <laughs> um, God, it's still, I, it still isn't really like, super accurate. And that <clears throat> obfuscation of fact is meant to, is meant to incite an emotion and an ex and a uh, judgment from the reader. Yeah. Like that's the other thing too is that at the end of the day, all of this information that we're getting from journalists have to sell the website or magazine or newspaper that they are writing from. They are there yeah. to make money and in order to get more readers more interested and to have those clicks and to have those things, even reputable uh, places such as the New York, as New York Times and The Cut and The New Yorker. Um, and that's an important part of all of this. Yep. Got to get their clicks. I also think at the end of the day, uh, it's important to recognize that these are the every single example that we've mentioned and, and have deep dive today is an example of women who have a friendship whose feelings get hurt like that's wow. it's just what it is people <laughs> having feelings that get hurt in relationships i for i have it's never happened to me I, <laughs> I am dead inside and outside so i don't understand it but apparently it happens so a, a big um, problem with these stories i feel like it, for a lot of them the situation is where we start mixing um, personal circles and professional circles. And we kind of like push these together and try to like make them work in the same space. And um, for a lot of people, it just simply, it simply doesn't. It is it is very difficult to, uh, for, for us that have been kind of uh, brought up in the society where we're taught that professional is about competing with each other, trying to also be friends with those same people you're competing with. It creates all of these weird situations and weird feelings and expectations of each other that are just not tenable. Which I think brings us into the great next section of the stream, which is where are the men? And where why do we like this? Where, do, where <laughs> are the men? And I where think do what where are them said? boys at? Where are, the bo think, where are them think, boys at? Who let the dogs out, you ask? I think yes. Karen, what you said is perfect, is that we are trained and raised in a society where we are constantly taught that what close friendship is is also competition. Mm -hmm. And that they're, they're, they're the same. Competition and close friendship go hand in hand within woman society. That is not... Uh, that is not something that is subconsciously taught in men's circles. So when we have situations of men tearing men down, it, it looks very different to this. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, so I think first let's ask like, you know, do these stories even exist with men? Is it that these stories exist and then they don't get published because they don't get the clicks or do these stories just not exist? So Sasha, I know you've done a lot of digging and research into this. Um, so if you could tell us like, do, can you find evidence that men do this anywhere close to the rate that women do this? So I don't, I did, I didn't do too, too much digging. I just was like Googling around. Um, but 
generally speaking, like this seemed to this used to be more of a men thing. I think interesting um, when it was like men are the real writers or like when men had these spaces where they dominated almost completely, um, you know, takedowns were more of a manly thing. Um, there is a super funny feud between Edmund Wilson and Vladimir Nabokov where like, <laughs> like I'm sorry, just like, the idea like, of them feuding cracks me up. <laughs> Listen, Nabokov is basically writing troll letters under, like, pen names, like, just being, like, a big shit. Um, <laughs> and, but, like, so that's, like, the big one that I found kind of in history. Some other radio takedowns have happened. But we're talking, like, I don't know, like, mid-20th century kind of stuff. Yeah. I found, like, one mean comment between, like, Stephen King and James Which Patterson. It's so funny. I saw that you put that. I just read On Writing by Stephen King, uh, which is where he, he doesn't call James Patterson out exactly, but he definitely alludes to James Patterson. They're the same fucking person. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, but it doesn't, like, it doesn't get to this level of, like, I don't know, story industrial complex. Like, I have read articles about um, male authors who turn out to be, like, kind of scammers or liars, but they're always framed as kind of, like, scammers or liars in their own right, and there is never what I'm going to call, like, um, the, the pro- there's never, like, a protagonist. It's not, mm. it's not framed as, like, protagonist versus antagonist. Well, um, they- it's just, it's just a villain with, like, a smattering of people who are deceived. Whereas with these women, there is a, a another woman vessel who is used as the reader conduit in some way to take the other one down. So what you're saying I, is I, like, there is really no male Carolyn Calloway in the publishing industry. That does not no, exist. No, no. What I'm saying is there's no male Natalie Beach in oh. the male industrial complex. Okay. Are there male Carolyn Calloway's? Absolutely. That, um... The million little pieces guy who went on. Oh Oprah. yeah. There's yeah. some other. I'm so sorry. I just. I'm gonna literally be the most generic. There's just some other literary dude who like elaborately lied about his life stories and like having cancer and his parents dying and a bunch of other hoopty hoop, um, that he uses to like purportedly embellish his um writing grant applications. I think was part of it, and his writing collections. Like you have people like that. Like you have you know, various grifters and bad actors, but there's no Natalie Beach. Mm, like you don't, mm-hmm. you don't have, like I said, this like male vessel that's used to like take down the other male vessel. Mm-hmm. I think it has a lot to do with the fact that um, the social economy of, of where people fall within the social structure within society uh, between men and women are very different. There is a lot of, um, privilege that comes along obviously with being a man and they don't have to play the game of social structure to the extent or in the same way that women do um Mm -hmm. and it's because they're competing for fewer spots with less power uh and women see each other directly as competition whereas men typically can exist in the same sphere without direct competition with each other all in james patterson and uh yeah king like, and let's mention one example where you have somebody that's wronged tons of people. So when you think of these stories from from men, it's typically not, like Sasha said, a, a one-in-one situation. It's kind of like yeah. you have a villain and then a trail of, of victims behind them, right? So um, Addison Kane has that. Addison Kane has a trail of victims behind her. She's done this over and over and over. But whenever you Google about the story, it's always Addison Kane versus Zoe Ellis. You know, the one, the one, um, the one victim that kind of stood up to her, right? And so Zoe Ellis becomes this kind of like amalgamation of all of Addison Kane's uh, victims that she has harassed over the years. And you just don't see this with the stories about men. That's just not the way that we that we write about them when we do publish those stories about men. So very different lens that we like to see these through. Mm -hmm. And everybody likes these stories. Like the reason that I remember these so distinctly is because they were events. Like this was the thing that was like that pocket was suggesting if you have Firefox and you have like their little app homepage, it's like, here's what you should read. Um, like these are things they're, they're getting tons of comments on Twitter. Uh, this is, you know, if you're watching Karen, you're probably a role player of some sort and role players tend to be adjacent to the literary world. And this was like big literary gossip at the time. 
um everybody was into these things um Mm -hmm. and it was it was it was either the thing of the day or like the thing of the week like Oh, Gosh, God. the bad art friend would lasted friend. forever. <laughs> My God, I, bad art friend. I think chronologically didn't last as long, but like emotionally, it, it feels like, like it, it did. <laughs> bad art friend like goes on. Like I'm gonna, ha- I'm gonna have like a reminder set to check on the bad art friend legal case in a year to see if it settles or gets dismissed or whatnot. Uh, awful stuff. Mm-hmm. Really anyway, awful stuff. So, like, you know, so um, the, the, for example, like the Carolyn Calloway piece, I've already referred to this, spawns the Carolyn Calloway writing complex. Um, there are so many articles about her. Um, thing about Carolyn Calloway is that um, associated with Natalie Beach's ghostwriting, um, her, her um, captions, Natalie is also supposed to be helping to ghostwrite a book that Carolyn Calloway gets in advance on. Um, Carolyn Calloway completely fails at writing this, as you as you know her relationship. And the book's Natalie. supposed to be a memoir style, by the way. It's supposed to be memoir style. Uh, Carolyn Calloway fails to deliver on this book, has to return her advance, which naturally she's already spent. And so, how does she make that money back? By having an OnlyFans. Yeah. So, but um, she's Carolyn Calloway like runs her OnlyFans for however long, doing like sexy literary content. And now she has like completely retreated from the internet. Um, she has deleted all of her tweets. I have not looked at her Instagram, but her Twitter is just like, I don't know, like 20 different mean jokes that she's retweeted about herself, which is like, it's very grim. It feels like a, like an internet cemetery. It's very mean. You can, you can tell that this is clearly taken a toll on her she has a, another book that's supposed to be coming out but it's like it comes out whenever so that's where carolyn calloway is uh, yeah. hopefully and it's uh, sad alive. it's so sad because it's literally like if you if you were following this along kind of when it was happening what it really seemed like was that she created the only fans literally to make the money back as soon as she made enough money she was like bye i got that i got my money see you done. later i didn't want to do this <laughs> It's terrible. It's terrible that she feels like she was pushed to that extent that she didn't have any other that she didn't have any other out. Um, that there was nothing obviously, she could do. And obviously, to fix that's this. a huge problem with the sex work industry in general. Like that's mm-hmm. um, the fact that if that's why women are getting into it, if they feel like they're forced to, that in itself is a tragedy. But then, because of the fact that it is so highlighted due mm-hmm. to the fact of everything that has happened around her and scrutinized because of that it just is exhausting and sad and and I, I and I can only imagine I can only imagine based on her past and everything that she had done and how infamous she was on the internet the types of comments she was getting on her only fans like that has to be draining let's not even let's not even think about that and my homage to Belle Delphine that I am doing with my <laughs> pink hair and cat girl ears I do love the aesthetic that's happening thank you I do too <laughs> I do too. But yes. Okay. All right. Is it, is it time for our, our ad shout? Yes. Okay, guys. So, um, so I looked for this. Um, and so no, Addison Kane and Zoe Ellis's, neither of their Omegaverse books are on Audible. Um, but if you would like to get another, uh, Omegaverse book on Audible, I did find one. So, um, we are sponsored on Interstage Window by Audible. If you would like to get your 30 day free trial, please use that link there. Um, it helps out the show. It helps out us. We literally get a kickback. So, um, if you have an Audible or are thinking of getting one, please get it through our link. So. The Omegaverse book that I found on Audible is the first of the Feral book series, which is apparently very popular in Het Omegaverse. I had no idea. I've never read um, Het Omegaverse. I really didn't realize that Het Omegaverse was a thing until this whole story came out. But anyway, it's called Obsession. Um, it is Het Omegaverse. If you are curious, then there you go. It exists on on Audible. <laughs> Omegaverse exists for butt babies. I will. <laughs> I will be reading it as part of my 100 books this year. It's oh, because you have to have, have so many books that you have to read anyway, right? Yeah. I have Might as well. Uh, <laughs> you're you're one short life on this earth. 
I'm gonna hate every minute of it, but you know what? It's probably an easy read, and <laughs> I will. Well, the reviews said it was. The, the reviews did say it was a very easy read, so I did. I did look at the reviews to make sure it wasn't like dog awful. Um, <laughs> and it's dog dog <laughs> awful. But I'm just... <laughs> yeah. so um so if you like that th sort of thing it seems like it's real hot and steamy but if it's not your thing um you know it's it doesn't seem like it's any different than any other het omegaverse it, based on the reviews i read let it be known that a line in the summary is the biggest scariest alpha on death row uh so just giving you an insight <laughs> i love that the way that um kendra just played the r.i.p uh sound alert and it played while you were saying the summary of that book <laughs> that was a choice <laughs> uh, i might not get through this book i'm gonna try though all right i believe in you tell me if it's if it's as um bad as i imagine it to be or if it's actually passable i will update it i think based on that description we immediately know the answer it's okay. <laughs> See, you just you said death row and i checked right the fuck out <laughs> Uh, hey, it's that, it's that 4.3 stars on Amazon, though. So. Yeah, people have no taste, okay? People mm -hmm. have shit taste. That's why the Marvel movies are so popular. <sighs> I said it. I did. Come By the way, uh, super super aside, not Marvel, but DC, but if you're not watching um, Peacemaker, you need to change that right now. It is James Gunn made the show. It's so good. It's so good. I, I promise. You instead read the Among of Us. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and anyways, you know what you should be doing, doing is watching I Peacemaker. Okay. <laughs> anyway, right. back to the topic. <laughs> Where's Addison Kane, you ask? Guess what? She's still bonkers, which is incredible. After someone makes a YouTube video, two YouTube videos breaking down your obvious like schizophrenia, and you're just like, will this prompt me to go to therapy? It will not because I didn't, you know what? It's like her white lady psychic protection is like some of the thickest I've ever seen. Like a lot of she's times- She's very dedicated to her role. That's, a, that's what it is. She's very listen, dedicated. Listen, like you have to have drunk so much of your own Kool-Aid and you got to have like some fucking five inch Kevlar around your brain that none of this is penetrated, <laughs> which is both like inspiring and like deeply frightening. Honestly, um, I, it sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Addison Kane continues to assert that her DMCA takedowns uh, were completely correct. Um, and then she has gone on to campaign against um, her former publisher, Blushing Books, um, and trying to get her rights back about her stories because a bunch of authors haven't been paid there. But like, mm -hmm. if you go onto her little page, um, you can see that, like, one of her pin posts is like, I continue to defend authors that have been plagiarized against. And you're like, all righty, ma'am. Um, also, her, like, background image, if Landon, you click on this and you go on her page, her background image, like, her cover photo is this hilarious illustration of her drinking the blood of her enemies. Let me oh, see wow. if I can do that. I've got it pulled well, up. It, yeah, so Karen's controlling the thing, but I got to tell you... I'm gonna drop mm. the link. I don't have um. I don't use a Facebook anymore, so I can't actually pull up her actual page. No. Uh, but here is the Facebook post that uh, Sasha is referring to. And yeah. I will link the photo in the chat so that everyone. Yeah, it's it's stuff. some good stuff. Um, Almanax, I'm reading all. I'm reading all the chats, and we've shouted out a couple of things that you guys have said. Yeah. Oh, is this is this like a mobile version of it? Clicky clacky. Let's look at this awesome image. This is oh, image, by the way. Like, oh that, my god! This is a little hot. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> Listen, as, you know, as Tarek of A Lab hot. says on his podcast, he's like, I'm not going to go too hard after Addison Kane because I think she's hot. Yeah. Um, you you know, have to respect the reality. <laughs> you can have a if you can have an artist draw a picture of you with wings while drinking wine and or blood out of a skull goblet. I'm gonna be into it. I'm so sorry. I'm more that. into fictional Addison Kane than mm -hmm. like real Addison Kane. Like real Addison Kane that has like the psychopath jawline. No, but, like fake Addison Kane looks like a role play character. Or she's Addison in anime. Kane. 
I'm here for it. Fictional Addic- Addison Kane doesn't just write het om- Omegaverse. She writes different kinds of Omegaverse too, which is incredibly <laughs> important to me. Use Addison Kane as a face claim for your role play character and then have her send a copyright notice after you. Like that's real courage. It's official goals. She'll maybe notice me. Yeah. Addison Kane would have fit in super me. well in Atlantis. I'm not going to lie. An Addison Kane FC. She would have fit in real well to that role play. I'm just saying. <laughs> Take me back. Okay. <laughs> back. oh god okay so so that's where addison kane is right now um she continues to play like the same part that she has played what it seems like her entire professional life i mean i just it, it's it's the same it's the same shtick um over and over and over it never stops never. Why should um it? okay for her. it's true it's working for her so so where where is our bad art friends though where are dawn and sonya where are bad art friends? So I would like to applaud Don Dorland, who apparently is not very online in general. Good. She is not an internet poisoned little freak like the rest of us. Good for her. <laughs> um, <laughs> the lack, it's the missing kidney that really helped out with that. Yeah. So she's just, I don't know. I think she's like a writer in residency somewhere. I, she might, I think she's working on a book if I check. But like, she's just kind of like, doing her own thing um she has she responded with some corrections to like um various like pieces that came out about her such as this gawker link that i have which also helps to clarify the timeline again because she's like very very specific and being like this is the timeline like sonia larson retained a lawyer before i did i only retained a lawyer when the BBF refused to provide me with the revised text that they intended to publish and distribute as a result of my uh, plagiarism claim. And, and Don point, and of course, Don points out that like this entire thing starts because Sonia chooses to plagiarize her letter. Like, you know, you can be kind of cheesed at maybe how Don responds, but it is true that Sonia is the inciting event. Oh, yeah. Um, of, of all of this. So Don seems to be okay, but Sonia Larson's tweets are still completely locked. So I feel like that's kind of indicative of what happens. As an aside, Sonia Larson is friends with some other bigger authors like Celeste Nitton. N- I'm pronouncing that wrong, but um, she wrote Little Fires Everywhere, which was a fairly popular literary paperback. And Celeste was a big team Sonia. She was part of that Grub Street thing. So like Sonia has like the fancier writer friends. Like I think implicitly Sonia has the superior writing chops, which is kind yeah. of end of all. I mean, she she is a better writer in general, I think. Like just yeah, in general, she just that's is. True. I think she just, yeah, I think we can say that uh, that Sonia is the better writer. Just not the better person. Uh, yep. They you can't have it all. You can't are. have it all. You can't they have really it all. So, so, so Sonia, I think, has um, essentially been kind of nerfed by this situation. And mm-hmm. I, I do want to say, like, as crappy as I think she is, um, I don't think that having her whole livelihood ruined is the answer either. I What I really wish is that there was some way kind of outside of the legal system for Sonia to take some kind of a, accountability and, like, issue an apology. What like, I... And, Oh, go on. I was going to say what I really hope for is I hope that both of these women, specifically Sonia, is, uh, went to therapy and learned uh, that their behavior was not acceptable and well, she will change her ways in the future. Well, I, Sonia, well, I, I hope, hope so. for sure. Well, Sonia, I hope for sure. The, I think the thing with John is that she enters into the legal system because there is no recourse for her on a personal level like the 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 harms that she has been done like Sonia um denies her any kind of accountability or recourse on a personal level and the legal battle is really just an extension of the personal hurt um which really sucks because it's gonna cost you like tens of thousands of dollars to maybe get a legal ruling in your favor and that still doesn't change like the underlying emotional betrayal yeah, yeah. It's not and like i think it, it sucks sorry yeah, go ahead like, no i was gonna say it's not like if she did win she would then have like like she's trying to prove that her livelihood has been hurt by this but it's not like she's suing someone who has a ton of money to give her if she does win. yeah 
Mm-hmm. There's they, there's not really like a lot of money in this game. No, there's it yeah. really Four artists suing each other. So. Yeah. yeah, and there's no going back at this point. Like everyone knows at this point what happened. Um, she can't take back that there's a bunch of people in the world that think she's super cringe and probably always will think that. Um, and there's nothing that the legal system can do for her that will correct that. And that's the true harm that she's really experiencing, not any kind of monetary harm. Like, let's be real. The yeah. good news is, is that because it's writing in an industry of writing, if she did write a book and it was found publishable, she could publish it under a different name and yeah. and yeah. kind of and kind of separate herself from the baggage of her name. However, uh, that's having to do it for that reason is really tough, especially someone who did and has you know suck has has looked for assurance from other people to validate her in a way that she did with like donating the kidney yeah Um, and that legal system's just an attempt to validate emotions is basically what happened which it can't do it can't do that and it Mm -hmm. and it won't even if she wins she won't feel validated because the reality is is that she still loses her name and her brand in that way yeah Mm -hmm. so And Sonia doesn't look like she's going to apologize is the other thing. Like once you've doubled down like this far, like, I guess it's kind of like the Addison Kane thing. Like, I guess once you go so far in the, like, I'm the real victim narrative that like, you're just, you, you can't let go because the psychic annihilation that you will experience is uh, devastating. And I think, and I mean, I, I guess we can hold up Carolyn Calloway as somebody who does not cling to her own narrative, who maybe, like, I don't know, I think with with Carolyn Calloway, like, when she goes and she does the, like, I'm at Cambridge wearing flower crowns, like, I actually think to some level that was sincere, and her desire to, like, hold these workshops for, like, self-improvement, where we arrange flowers, I mean, I think that was naive, and I think that there was, like, some level of grifting involved, conscious or unconscious, but I do think that she meant it and to be turned into like this parody figure and like subjected to so much criticism that implies that you're just utterly full of shit I actually think that like she now sees herself kind of as a parody figure and like her self-conception has been deeply altered so if you're not able to cling to this view of yourself that you've pitched to the public like you dissolve Mm -hmm. And so it's the, which is, I guess the other terrible thing or an especially terrible thing about these stories and how we all consume them, because once that happens, like, like we are all plugged into who we think these people are and like, who's the good guy and who's the bad guy and how we're conceiving of these story characters, essentially like goes out into the world and changes the way a real person like experiences their life Mm -hmm. and that's Mm -hmm. dark (laughs) it is it's very dark so even though i i think that as far as like a um healthy quote-unquote reaction to this kind of thing caroline calloway probably has the best one it's still a terrible situation that she's found herself in and it can't feel good you know, um, who knows what kind of uh, long term ramifications this this has on her. Luckily, it seems like she is um, she's mostly logged off at this point. So we don't really know, which is good. Good. We shouldn't know. But, um, you know, it's still sad. It's still sad because it can't be good. Mm-hmm. It it can't be good. Yeah. So I think I think we're to look at this. We're actually we're, we're on actually time at this like point. On time. And well, so why do we like this? Yeah, Let's talk about we're not quite. We still got several questions on this particular <laughs> <laughs> no, but we're we're getting we're close. We're close to where we're, we intended to be. So yeah, why do, why do we like this? Um, I don't. I guess I can kind of say some of the things that uh, that I always plug into with this that I, I talked about at the beginning is um, I did not have the best female friendships towards the end of my high school career. It was very tumultuous for me. There was a lot of um, arguing because I was one of my friends that. Um, I guess, I mean, I've said it before, so and it's relevant to hear. 
Um, but I lost my virginity first, and that created a lot of um, feelings in my friends, and I became the target of uh, of uh, certain uh, competitive urges uh, within within those girls, mixed with a whole great old soup of purity culture. It was fantastic. Um, and so when I read these stories, I'm kind of taken back to there and I'm just like, you know, this is exactly what I went through. Like, it feels so super relatable. And so I'm just like, I'm like instantly sucked in and I can see like which of the women I identify with more. And I'm just like, I want to know more about them and more about the story. And, you know, it's, it's, it's relatable is the truth. It's relatable for me. Yeah, I think um, while there are, are certainly some relatable aspects to it, I read it often like a story and I forget sometimes that these people are human until I really actively try to think about that, which is the purpose of the articles. Like mm -hmm. that is why, that is the ultimate goal. I fall into the trap that is the ultimate goal. Um, and it's one of those things where it's like, okay, I like reading and divulging and, and, and trying to figure out dynamics between two people. That's something that I just really like to do. Um, cause I'm a psychopath that way. And, uh, <laughs> and so this gives me an opportunity to do it in a way that is real and feels real, uh, and is a quick read and can be over and it doesn't really affect me. Yeah. Um, it's, it's easy to dissociate like you do with a book, yeah. except that you don't have to put in nearly as much commitment. Yeah. It's, it's 10 minutes instead of, uh, you know, 10 hours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fighting is fun. I'll just, I'll just say that like conflict other people's conflict is enjoyable um again like a narrative where i can you can pick out who's the good guy and who's the bad guy um also all of these people kind of seem glamorous in a way like um even if they're being criticized as like good creatives or bad creatives they are at least in some way i guess for me they are creatives, like they are being identified as creatives, like their primary identity in the story is as a creative, like they're not being identified by like whatever their boring day job was, or whatnot, or like any other identity, like these are all people who are like participating in the art sphere in a very formal way. And so I think part of what happens with me is like, I envy everybody on all sides because even the bad guys are people who are trying to be known for their literary work. Whereas I am much more reclusive um, about who has access to me and like what work I put out at all and why. So just from a, like a personal standpoint, it's getting to project into these people who are like out there fighting for their right to write wolf porn and like that, <laughs> you know what? Or fighting for their right to be a fucking Instagrammer, which is something that like I that I that'll consider for like six minute periods at a time before being like, nope. <laughs> Not doing it. <laughs> uh, that feels so real <laughs> yeah, I also think that there's a nice escapism to it that the ramifications no matter which way this argument goes it doesn't affect you you can turn it off and you can just sit there and be like all right well that happened and it doesn't it doesn't matter because it's not about you you're not in it you can get all those same emotions that if you were in it and be in, enjoying that like fighting uh, and then you can be like, actually, I'm done reading this article. I'm going to bed. Yeah. Uh, and I, I mentioned this also in our, our little outline where it's just like what we get invested in is stuff that we feel that we can like disconnect from. But also just like if you think about it, like the depths of people's takes that they have on some of these things like I don't know like I'm having like kind of like a psychological analysis here as well as kind of like this gender and financial analysis but a lot of people spend a lot of time on these things that I don't think aren't necessarily examining it for its systemic reflections and I think that's because sorry to get serious and stream but like a lack of civic engagement like are you in, do you know who's on your school board do you know about zoning arguments like or like zoning laws or like crap like that have you ever been to like a city council meeting I sure haven't um and you know instead my energy goes to reading six pieces about the kidney episode 
Um, <laughs> so like, I, I think that there is in some ways like a, a diversion of a lot of psychic energy or, from things that do affect our lives. Like we are, it's not like we are specifically going to it because it doesn't affect our real life. Mm -hmm, like between, mm -hmm. we're choosing between something that personally affects us truly that we can affect back. This is important. It's not, well, it's like, well, global warming affects you, but like, honestly, what are you going to do about that? Are you on, are you Exxon mobile? Um, you know, <laughs> your, your options are limited unless you want to commit terrorist attacks on like oil rigs. Um, <laughs> and I did not endorse that. If if you choose to do that, this is not endorsement, encouragement, or support. Um, but uh, you know, like things that affect you that you can affect back. Like I mean, there, there, but there are. I think the examples that you gave earlier are definitely things that we could be doing, right? Like you could be going to your city council meetings. If you have an HOA in your neighborhood, you could be going boring. to the HOA meetings. That's if so you boring. if you have a kid, so, yeah, if you have a child do, in the school system, so you could be doing that. You could be going to the school, you know, this uh, school board meetings. Like you could do be that. doing those things. And <laughs> Let me uh, tell you, I do some of this stuff. Way more fun to read about the kidney. Way more fun. <laughs> hey, you know what? You. Thank you, Landon, for being a person. Like while the rest of us are like. It's I, it's totally selfish. A HOA, please don't make me pay more. Second, I am in the school district. Please don't pay me less. <laughs> <laughs> You're like I'm forced to participate, and that's why I'm here. Yeah, uh, uh, kidneys, and I'm reading articles about kidneys and kidney donations while at these meetings because. The meetings <laughs> <are boring. laughs> but, uh, yeah, and you know what? Here's the other thing, like. Frankly, creatives are bonkers. As a creative, I am completely bonkers. I am just leaned into it at this point, but I have been putting my brain in a blender since I was like 12. And mm -hmm. now I've turned it into glitter that I just cough on people. Um, so the, the thing is, is that if you are really into like the value of your thoughts, man, and how you got to like tell them to people and express them in the world, you are uniquely predisposed to being batty. Like you have been thinking about yourself a lot. And the more you think about yourself, the crazier you get. Like God. people who don't think about themselves are some of the sanest people around. And the more you think about yourself, it's just like, it's a graph. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it's a bell curve. I have to disagree with you. I think it's a bell curve. I think that there are some people that like, like don't think about themselves at all. Super fucking batty. And then we get like, you get a little bit and you're fine and you're good. And then you think about yourself too much. It's a bell okay, curve. Okay, you know what? Actually, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Say, That's right. I can see that point, Landon. I think you are correct. I think it is a bell curve. If you have a complete absence of thought about yourself, you're bonkers. And then the more you think about yourself, you also become bonkers. And creatives mm -hmm, tend mm -hmm. to be on that right end of the bell mm -hmm. curve. People who have well, and that's and that's why drama within like the role play communities and within the fanfic communities and stuff like that that we tend to participate in is just absolutely gripping. <laughs> like <laughs> it's also a reflection of the drama that is happening in areas of art that are similar yeah. to the RP community. I mean, yep. frankly, this the shit that is happening in these articles is the same shit that has happened in RP communities. Oh yeah. It's just they're happening at a wider scale with a much larger audience. That I mean, as wrapped in. she's, she stole the idea of head Omega verse from me. Like, fuck that is Tumblr drama. Like that that's is, just straight up Tumblr drama. Yeah. Yeah. The idea of, Oh my God, this person is crazy. I'm going to write an RP character about them. Hello, I think all three of us have at least engaged in that idea. I have uh, definitely done that. I would like, I, w I will own that one. Hopefully not I, in front of them. Hopefully you did it privately. Oh, no, not, yeah, no, that, you know, that was not done in, in front of that specific person. But definitely I was like, all right, here you go. There are certainly <laughs> things that have been said to me that I have plagiarized into an RP conversation. Uh, like, like this is all existing on the micro within our communities. And it just so happens that this hit, this same drama hit a larger audience, yep. which means it is, ha and like, you can even argue it down to social circles. Shit like this happens in large women circle, social circles of like six, six women or more. Like, you're going to start getting this petty little shit of like, oh my God, let me, let me make fun of this one. We have a side 
group chat to make fun of some of the people in the larger group chat. Like, we, <laughs> no longer, we have that group chat. <laughs> I've done that before with m- multiple different circles of friends. And that's why like, that's why I'm so quick to si- decide with the Sonya's and I have to like check myself and remember being cringe and annoying isn't actually a bad thing. And Sonya went way too far. <laughs> oh yeah. You could totally, like, here's the thing. We all have made fun of people that are in the, the bigger group chat. And guess what? People have made fun of me. Frankly, I assume that everyone who is friends with me has complained about me behind my back at some point. Me too. Me too. <laughs> I, do not hold, I do not hold that against them because if you have ever truly loved somebody, you have become conscious of how they are an annoying motherfucker. Mm-hmm. Like, it is inevitable. If you don't think I'm an annoying motherfucker, like, you probably don't know me well enough yet to really like me. So, <laughs> That's right, Kendra. Like, I am I am sure that at some point you have messaged, like, Landon or Naomi and somebody like, Karen's being a fucking bitch right now. Like, fuck her, fuck her whatever. <laughs> You could totally do that, and I'm sure I've been, like, made fun of, and just as long as it's not, like, I don't know, in direct contradiction to the relationship that we're having, like, I don't, I don't take, like, some general complaining personally, but, but yeah. I think that's part of growing up, right? Like, you can't, because otherwise you wouldn't have any friends. (laughs) I don't want to be friends with someone who thinks I'm perfect. I think yeah. that's bad. Also part of how, because I do think that in, in at least my experience, this is a woman heavy, in like this is how women interact with each other. These things of like separate group chats do not happen in circles of men very so often. They don't think. It's because <laughs> they do not think, okay? It's because they haven't been socialized this way to compete against each other in so been, social settings. They've been socialized to punch each other directly in the yes, face. Like, yeah. Which like is men. why and, men do that. That's why they listen, punch each other and, in the face. And fun fact, when I get directly confrontational with people in a lot of role play spaces where I'm just like, come over here and say that to my face, holy shit, people freak out. They're like, why are they you don't like it. me? I'm they don't like, like that. No, listen, come over here. Just like, just, you have a really pretty cheek. Let me slap it. Yeah, um, just, no, just come over here and punch me in the face. Like I can tell that you want to, and then I'll punch you back. And we don't have to engage in this like passive aggressive side chat shit. Okay. But like, yeah, so I think men are socialized to be more like much more directly combative as, in, as opposed to engaging in these things. Do men have friends? Actually, I don't know. They don't. Um, but no, I think <laughs> half jokingly. <laughs> I think an also an important aspect of this too is that it's also that holding on to it due to the fact that the issues are actually rarely talked about, the conflicts are rarely resolved, women tend to hold on to issues for a lot longer. And the result of us holding on to issues in big big media scheme ends up being that there's a lawsuit about hurt feelings Mm -hmm. like that's because we won't directly sit there and say hey you're a bitch for the fact that you wrote this book about me and that you did this and you took it out of concept and now I don't like you and you're a liar and you're a bitch and I hope people see the way you are like I the (laughs) fact that she that that Dawn never did that as far as we're aware has now resulted in the fact that they are suing each other for costing them each tens of thousand dollars for something that I think Bree said earlier was like three hundred to four hundred and seventy five dollars. Yeah, yeah four like, four hundred and twenty five dollars. Four dollars yeah. <laughs> short story. They're both spending tens of thousands of dollars on hurt feelings, which I get. It is the most woman thing ever, but this happens on every aspect of of friendship within women, and that's something that I think needs to bring attention to. Mm-hmm. I have I have a I have a man that wanted a message me to affirm that men in, indeed do communicate by punching each other yes. but um, <laughs> but male role players do tend to be a bit more passive aggressive Yes. Mm. And that makes sense. Well, I mean, and that's that's my experience in um in men's spaces as well, that the the more I guess you could say the closer to having uh individuals that are more marginalized that the men's space has, like gay men's spaces or trans men's spaces or things like that, um, you do tend to have a little bit more catty behavior. So I, I think it is or, some in some ways a byproduct of marginalization. Or the longer that a uh, man stays in a majority women gendered space and then they can kind of become that way (laughs) 
then they start to interact with that particular social group in that way. Yeah, uh, it's very. I mean, and you can see this. You can see this in like you have a partner who is, um, who was uh, assigned male at birth and has raised and was raised socially, like socialized that way. Uh, you can see this with your own friend groups when he interacts with your friends. You can see that he'll start interacting differently than he will around his own friends. We obviously all do this and change. Mm-hmm how we interact with the relationships that we have around us, but it's, it's a fascinating topic in psychology. But it's like, but it's like always, like when it comes to women's spaces, it seems to be like an always thing. Yes, it is. It is always. And it is because we are fighting for that social economy. Like we're fighting for that power and that position of, of having the most social for like the most social power and the most influence among us because that is what makes us powerful as women or that's at least what we've been told makes us powerful Mm -hmm. as women there's ways that you're allowed to be powerful i think is very important you are not allowed to be powerful as someone who engages in a lot of direct confrontation um that is going to be framed as like bitchy aggressive bullying like over the top and even um, on the scale, it's now being, it's now like even being switched that it's not even that. It's a pick me version. Ah, uh, yes. The, and the now, you're, the now you're the pick me girl where it's like, okay, I'm either a straightforward bitch or I'm a pick me girl. That behavior is exactly the same, just dependent on what is acceptable within mm-hmm. the social society of that group. You are um, being, you're being too assertive. You are yeah. having too strong of a personality. And the only reason you could ever be having that strong of a personality is because it's a character defect or it's because it's a ploy to acquire your heterosexual life partner uh yes so it's it's (laughs) i love the way you phrase that a ploy to acquire your heterosexual life partner it just cracked me up ladies call me um anyway so victoria mentioned this very briefly but um the the victimhood and femininity, it's almost like you, you know, you get your real woman badge um, yes. by being the right kind of victim in some way. That is an assertion of your value and implicit purity, yep. your moral purity. I also want to, I also want to bring to attention to that this is, this is at least the experience of white women. Sir. White women, yes. Yeah. So this is important to also suggest to say that different that different races and the way that they are raised and the way that people are raised in different communities communicate differently and have different social dynamics. Yes. Mm-hmm. This is, this so is related white to this. Women circle of this is, yeah. yes. all and all of these stories, stories, yeah, only one of the characters is not a white woman, right? Like Sonia is the only person that's Sonia that's not is the is the only person who is not white in these stories. And all of these stories are about the emotional lives and inner worlds of white women. So like in this sphere, it's like what women are allowed to have emotional lives that are considered relevant or interesting to the public at large. Who is allowed to have an emotional conflict that is considered worthy of a piece by the cut or worthy of a piece by the New York Times? Like, I don't think it's an accident. Like, you know, we we were joking about how Addison Kane looks, but like, is it really an accident that she kind of becomes such a focal point? I feel like there is that, you know, it's a very subtle implication of, you know, white ladies, white ladies are the ones who get to have real feelings. Yes. It Um, does feel that way. White traditionally and at least one of them is also traditionally perceived as beautiful Mm -hmm. um i think is also an important aspect of this too because again that is that is what makes it marketable for these media companies too too i would say that carolyn calloway and Mm -hmm. addison payne both meet a standard of classical attractiveness that I think, ooh, which by the way, I think even excites the viewer because it's like, oh, I get to make the pretty white girl the bad guy. Well, and yeah, thrilling. It, well, it's like I mean, I get to make the pretty white girl a bad guy, and then in the in the case of Natalie, Natalie is the person who does not feel pretty enough because mm-hmm. she wasn't 
because she was not the Instagram model. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, yeah she's, I mean, she's Natalie is unattractive. I no, know. she's not. She's not unattractive, but she's definitely like the um, she's definitely like the goth girl character. You know, she's the Daria character. She's the Diane character, right? Like she's the not the girl that's like overlooked and she looks like that like she has exactly what hollywood wants us to think is that overlooked girl look yeah and and i don't think she is those things but in comparison to an instagram model Mm -hmm. who is making her brand about her herself and her body i mean let's be honest instagram is pictures of yourself like for the most part that is what people use it for so she is her own brand her body is her brand and (laughs) I know. I don't like that. <laughs> I don't either, but that is the situation in which we've we've found ourselves in. I love living and in the modern world. It's mm. fan fucking tastic. Uh, I hate everything about it. And like it even goes down to the fact that at the end of the day, she had to make her body her brand in an even more way when she had an OnlyFans. Mm-hmm. And yep. she had to sell herself even more. And, or to have access to that, right? Because yeah. is that the same person? The best way for I- her to make her money yeah. back, she yeah. correctly identified, was OnlyFans. Was only she was fans. right. <laughs> so- and that and that goes and that just goes to show just the situation. Yeah, it's. I hated yeah, that yeah. it came out of my mouth, but it felt accurate. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it's it's horrible because it was wrong. Um, there's all there's other conflicts um, in the. The, the writing world of um more marginalized women there's one that like really stuck out to me that lives in my brain rent free um the author um Emily Wen Zhao and her book Blood Hair um she got basically brigaded into not publishing a book um because it was said to have um like racist depictions of slavery um which I'm not sure if you know about slavery being like in very racist as just a just a thing in the western world so um Hmm. there's been two main there's been two main types of slavery throughout human history it's either like somebody like a a people goes and conquers another people and they become Mm -hmm. slaves so that's you know going to be xenophobic or it's going to be like the racialized chattel slavery that we had during the um colonial era which is going to be racist so like i don't know that there's ever been a slavery slavery in human history that's not like that also through a religious slavery like what is happening in Myanmar right now but uh that also has to do a lot with like racism because a lot of the religious uh are- yeah like I, I feel like that's even like a a, a racist slash xenophobic type of situation as well when you dig into it mm-hmm. but you you can argue that that is the authority. yeah so this author gets like goodreads and twitter brigaded to the point that she like withdraws her book from publishing um, there's also the the Isabel Fell scenario. Oh, Fall. Isabel Fall. Isabel Fall. Isabel Fall, which is a trans woman whose story gets brigaded all to hell. And that and, and like that gets like a takedown. That eventually does get a piece written about it um later, but I definitely haven't seen it get the traction that like um bad art friends did. So it's nope. like cis, it's cis white women who get um who get like all of the attention here but there are other there's and that's that's an important thing to note about like the privilege of whose feelings almost get to be hurt Mm -hmm. um as opposed to these other people who suffer very notably it's true devastate devastating and permanent impacts to their their careers with no recourse and very little attention so like I think about the Isabel Fall situation in in particular and that is fascinating to me in the same way that a lot of these other stories are fascinating to me but people don't care about that nearly as much as they care cared about bad art friend they don't like they're not talking about it nearly as much it doesn't seem to capture people's attention as much it doesn't seem to trend as much um but uh but uh it 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 was but it was very similar in the kind of like you know lights that it lights up in my brain (laughs) so it's it is sad but it's true yeah so take take note everybody that um oh white supremacy is alive and well it's everywhere did you know (laughs) everywhere yes just just a reminder fair reader 
Um, mm -hmm. So next, next thinking point, we've already kind of talked about this, but it's projecting into these people as if they are storybook characters. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that ultimately, like we are being told a story and that should be something that you kind of hold in the front of your mind. Because like, for example, like when you read a book and the author tells you about a character, like the only material that exists about this character is the material that the author invents. Like, you know, there's fan fiction that like will speculate like what kind of deodorant the character has like in their in their bathroom. But like literally speaking, like the only information that exists is that which is invented as opposed to portrayals of, of real people and of these stories in which there are fundamentally exclusions. Um, and there is always more information out there. There's always more than what you're seeing and is important to try to pick up the patterns of what you're being shown so that you can be like, hey, like what's going on here? And honestly, that was kind of what made me um, come out for Don Dorland before I had even dug up like all of my sources. Like I was just kind of going on this kind of gut instinct of how this story was being arranged. And I was like, this just doesn't, feel right to me and when I like comb through this more carefully instead of going by like the emotional impression that it's trying to convey there are there are tells here there are clues this just doesn't feel right to me it and didn't pass your smell test it didn't pass my smell test and the, and so I think what's it's important for all of us to have a smell test like as fun as this stuff is to like just kind of like chew on sometimes like a nice tender piece of beef jerky like you have to apply some sort of critical thinking when you are being told about the emotional experiences of real people especially when you're getting like a good guy bad guy narrative mm -hmm. yep i think the fictionalization of real people um always has a sort of uh, potential to be dangerous in in so many ways that you've highlighted and um and you know i've i've shared with landon before that there's certain uh time periods of historical fiction that i really struggle enjoying because of that <laughs> And I think that this is one of those um, areas where that comes into play as well, because that's exactly what's happening. It's not historical fiction, like we're not writing about, you know, dead people or old people or anything like that. But we are, um, you know, reading and writing about real people and creating fictions around them. And we end up doing the exact same thing as we're doing when we write like historical fiction about, you know, um, Cleopatra and, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and, and Caesar and, you know, yeah, Mark Antony and like these characters that are, that are, that there was no way we could possibly know, except for in these stories, these people exist and we, we could know, and they could easily be hurt by it personally. Yeah, our brains are not developed in a way to understand like concepts of people existing beyond the tangible of of the actual like people in our circles. Uh, so it takes a lot of work to realize that, which means if mm -hmm. your brain automatically goes, oh my God, this is, this is fictitious and I don't have to care and I can turn off and I'm not thinking about the, you know, moral and, and emotional side effects of consuming a story like this. That's normal. It just is important to recognize that, yeah, these are real people with real lives and careers that are destroyed and emotional baggage that will then be, that they'll have forever because of this shit. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and to not and to do your best to not participate in it. Do not, do not. Uh, if I may make a single recommendation to everyone here, do not tweet. No, Never don't. tweet. Do not tweet even once. Just go into your DMs and whatever <laughs> shitty take that you have about some annoying person on the internet. Just go fucking tell phone a friend. Like, do, <laughs> avoid public social media discourse at all costs, and you will avoid ever being party to someone's like psychological collapse yeah uh keep They're your keep your hands clean yeah um and it's okay if you fall into it if you think it if you agree with it if you don't but yeah keep be Listen, keep yourself keep yourself out of it thinking mm -hmm. is free and so are dms okay mm -hmm. thinking is free and so are dms just after you exchange your dms 
Don't publish a story about them. It's also clarifying, don't get into the person's DMs. Get into your own fucking yeah. DMs. Never, <laughs> no, don't do DM not. the other person. Like, DM your friends. DM your friends. Do not be DMing strangers about what you think about their behavior. Like, just don't do it. Yeah, don't, don't, don't be like Sonya. Don't be like Sonya and let your catty shit get out of your group chat. Keep yeah. it there. Before you tweet something, like sit there and go, would I want to hear this on a random Tuesday afternoon from a stranger? And yeah, if the answer you, is no, then don't fucking push send. Because you can't control <laughs> if that person that's the subject of your tweet is going to come across it. So if you're going to tweet mm -hmm. something, you need to make sure that you would be okay with that person stumbling across it and reading it. And if you're not, it should not be tweeted. If you and wouldn't be willing to say it to their fucking face. Yeah, because yeah. that's what you're doing. That's what you're potentially doing when you tweet. You're, you're potentially saying, saying it to their, their face. face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is and going to hide behind a computer screen to sit there and go, he'll never, they'll never see it. To sit there and be like, it's just shouting into the void. It's not shouting into the void, especially if you're adding and tagging somebody. Like, yeah. <laughs> and again, like, if you're not willing to say it to their face, like in a Starbucks, like if you would be like, if someone said this to my face in a Starbucks it would be bad, then that's what you should go with. Also, a lesson from Sonya. Um, if somebody annoys the shit out of you, do not continuously expose yourself to them. Sonya had the option of like seeing this Facebook group and being like, this is the most annoying white lady and just being like hitting leave group. She could have done that. If you're constantly exposing yourself to stories about people that annoy the shit out of you or like vicariously consuming a ton of drama that compels you to engage in this like meta commentary like have don't or no. if you <laughs> have to because you're an emotional masochist who needs to go to therapy uh <laughs> then just acknowledge the fact that you are doing it to yourself mm -hmm. that's no one... the other that's the other coin if you're like i can't do that i like it too much cool you're well within your lane to like it you are doing it to yourself another person existing is not a slight against you you get to be you get to own your own fucking feelings mm -hmm. yep <laughs> they're just they're just there man and if they bother you that much i don't know man like Fuck. i don't know I, 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 I do, we all do we, we all do weird stuff that's like maybe not the best for us so not in a total position to judge but like the the overall recommendation is like you know maybe maybe we just leave the facebook group maybe we don't check on that one twitter like maybe we don't follow certain tags like all the time because because then you it, it does it does make you crazy because when you are putting this kind of content in front of yourself all of the time you're you're literally making it your world like your world is what you allocate your time to and even though these things like on the, the grander scale of the world are very small, if you spend five hours of your 16 waking hours, it's going to feel like a huge percentage of the world to you. And you got to be careful about that. Yeah, and I know I have to remind myself of that. If you scroll through my Twitter, I'm sure you can find tweets that I've made that's like, eh, I probably should not have tweeted that. Probably should have kept that in the drafts. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, so, you know, I don't think anyone is without sin in this regard. No. So it's something that we're all constantly having to remind each other of and keep each other in check. And, and we can do that. Like, we can keep each other in check. Like, if you see somebody that's starting to like, oh, you know that they didn't like so-and-so, they've been complaining about them a lot in the group chat or whatever, and you see them start to actually treat that other person poorly publicly, Publicly, you know, by like not liking any of the posts and continuing to stay in the community, then maybe it's okay to tell your friend like, hey, maybe you shouldn't be in the Facebook group anymore. You know, I noticed this comment right here was kind of snide. Maybe you shouldn't have said that, you know. Nobody stopped Sonya. Like nope. all of your friends are bad. Like they are all bad. Like Celeste Nig and just being like, I would have been like, Hey girl, like, yeah, she is cringy, but do we want to plagiarize her, her letter straight up? Oh, like the protagonist of Sonya's story was initially named Dawn and signs her, her emails the same way that Dawn is known to sign them kindly. Yeah, like, I, I was like, if I was your friend, I would be like, Hey, listen, I love you but we're going to write this letter and burn it. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like if you look through those group chats, though, some of her friends kind of did seem to have that opinion. Um, but of course, Sonia did what Sonia did anyway. So mm -hmm. I'm sure there's some of those people in those group chats that don't talk to Sonia anymore. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. sure and, like. and, and so lastly, kind of related to like what we yeah. put in front of ourselves, uh -huh. like when we're only exposed to women writers, when they're like virtuous or like catty bitches or like conforming with this narrative, like this affects how we see ourselves as creatives, how we see ourselves as people, how we see ourselves as community members. Like, you know, it, it, it makes you inherently distrustful. I, you know, I think everybody has kind of expressed or at least all three of us have expressed, um, you know, difficulty feeling connected to other women. I've definitely related to that. And all of these narratives about like cattiness, shallowness, competitiveness, definitely infiltrated and still kind of infiltrate my worldview and make me feel guarded or competitive or that I have to assert myself in ways that I don't particularly enjoy or don't really align with my moral worldview. And when you see these stories get blown up, it almost feels inevitable. Like this is what happens if you become, you know, like a real creative, do you wanna know what you're gonna do? You're gonna get into a big fight with some other lady. Like you can't, like it's gonna be some lady, you don't know which lady, but it's gonna be some other lady. So you better like have your ears and eyes open at all times. And I think that is just bad because you don't, I don't know, you don't see, God, can I think of any story that's just like, and now for a touching story between two women who supported one another. Like, Boring, who wants to read that? I do, I do actually, I do. I want that. <laughs> New York Times, are you listening? I want to hear about two women's supporting each other that, through that good times about, and bad. That sounds about <laughs> as exciting as a school board meeting. Listen, it's way, I don't think that's going to get any clicks, Sasha. <laughs> it's way, you know what? Fine. I'm just going to go out here and create my own content about people loving good. and supporting each other. Goodbye. I love that. <laughs> No, I think I think that that is great, and I think that if we, that's the best we can do, the rec the thing is though is that until I don't think that'll ever sell clicks. So the best we can do is just highlight that in our everyday lives, mm -hmm. and to put that example on ourselves and encourage the people around us to continue that example. And that's that's the best we can do, unfortunately, because you're right; it's never going to get as many clicks as the woman writing a revenge book about the woman who sold her kidney mm -hmm. or who, who donated, donated her, kidney. her kidney yeah mm -hmm. might have sold it who knows see now i'm starting rumors um, <laughs> you are but, responsible for the subsequent tweets yes <laughs> i do think we need to start wrapping up though we are at time so let's let's give final thoughts any final pieces of advice from anybody um this is obviously a really heavy episode full of fun facts Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, here's here's a nice thing. Okay. Um, this is for, for you, Sasha. Two poets chronicle their friendship and isolation during the pandemic. I think it's about people being friends. That's um, this is it. Thank you, Lauren, go. for giving I, me the, the content that I need. That's and the what they write each other, they write poems about each other. They both live in oh, Paris. Yeah. Both poets. They have written each other, yes. That's Good news article. We were going to ask for it. This is it right here. Yeah. This is, it. This is perfect because oh. we always end with oh. some good news. <laughs> oh, here we go. Consider this. Life. Yes, here's a poem exchange from May of last year. Her six floor dormer, a cigarette, the much loved view of our skyline. Claire, critical care intern, size for one after 20 hours on breathless feet. Evening applause is sweet but she chose PPE over the president's praise and eggs on the grocery shelves. KN, 1st of May, 2020. And then here's the response poem. Shelves in the G20 are still filled with coffee, cheese, brown eggs, gigagurettes, Greek yogurt, milk, wine, but I hurry, forget tomatoes, get out of harm's way, masked, gloved as fast as I can. Food shopping once was a community, communion poison is the chalice now so they're writing back and forth about all of their feelings complicated feelings they're having about the pandemic i know this uh speaks to me going to the grocery store in may 2020 was quite nerve-wracking it is still kind of nerve-wracking now i still try to go first thing in the morning so i don't have to encounter nearly as many people um so yeah oh this is so nice i'm so glad they're able to support each other through the pandemic 
And also, I guess, good thing to, to point out is like, look at us. We're all here together, Absolutely. brought together by creativity. So it is, it is in fact possible because Absolutely. we're, sh we're showing you how to do it. Look yep. at that. You can, you can go talk about ladies with the other ladies in, in a way that has compassion and tenderness. It can be done. Mm -hmm. And empathy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lead with empathy. And I think, um, and I think when it comes to this sort of thing, you know, for me, guys, if something ever happens and I totally screw up and uh, this content creation actually takes off, um, which I don't think it will because I still treat the internet like web 1.0, but, um, but if it ever does, uh, and I start to get into it with some other ladies, y'all just like bop me, just like, just like DM me and no. be like, no, like just yeah. bat me on the nose. Like I'm a bad kitty cat. No, but we have like, to warn them so we much. To, I need to stop you. But we have to <laughs> warn them ahead of time that there is a feud between you and I pre-planned in order to get more views. Oh, well, if it's like that, then don't worry. We'll update all the people that really care, which is the discord. We'll be like, this is a yes. bit guys. Don't worry, but don't That's tell anybody. <laughs> That's why I'm still here. Uh, we don't suck at boundaries. <laughs> but other than that, all of us. Um, yeah, and and I I challenge everybody out there who is listening, who will watch this uh, stream and watch the VOD to challenge yourself to review and reflect in ways in which you might, if you especially are a, a woman, that you might not have engaged in best practices of being in social circles as a woman and in ways that you can change uh, throughout. And then also, uh, if you are any other gender, I would suggest that you perhaps listen to this and listen to other women speak on this topic. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So that, that being said, um, Sasha, is there any other thoughts that you would like to leave people with? If not, my question for you is where can everybody find you? What would you like to um, plug towards the end of the stream today? And also thank you so much for coming on. Sasha streams are oh, always awesome. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me and, and doing my topic that I suggested to you, like on a, on a riff. <laughs> it's a so good topic thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you for that thank you for having me uh, thank you to all of my pals who showed up to listen to me talk I appreciate that look at the all gal pals I love you all um, where can you find me you can find me on my role play website oh god I'm going to tell this to people who don't know about it yet <laughs> Barbara I posted Oops. the Discord. I don't know if you wanted the website or the Discord, but that's what my, I chose. My website, if you are a role player, is barbermonger.me, where you can search for role plays as if it's Craigslist and a, about as much moderation, because I don't care. Uh, I also hang out in my Discord, where I have a channel that I just post long essays into and ramble about them. And I have a lot of clown emojis, so... Um, <laughs> you want to be a clown communist that is that is my server uh, or you can just i have appeared on some of karen's other vods without my face though so this is we've upgraded we've thing. upgraded since then mm -hmm. yep so now everybody also knows what you look like really great facial expressions like <laughs> 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 But you can pause that. I'm sure. I'm sure there's there's going to be some great screenshots turned into emojis. I look forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so if you want to join up um, with Sasha's on Sasha's website, it is also very Web 1.0, um, which is part of why I love it so much. It uh, it definitely harkens back to the old role play uh, days. So if you're if you're reminiscent of that, if you're kind of like nostalgic for that, Barbara Monger is a great place to find type those types of people that also feel that way. I will I will not proceed into the future. <laughs> I'm not gonna do it. It it's bad, and I'm staying it's, here. It's bad and rough out here. Stay there. Stay there. No. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Landon. Um, where can everybody find you? You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Land in Maine. Um, and you can also find me on Karen's Discord. I lurk a lot, but sometimes I make sarcastic comments that land I or don't. Uh, I make it regardless. <laughs> Uh, you can also find me here at ESW basically every single week. Uh, I like to miss a few here and there just to keep things spicy. 
spicy. And that's about it. Uh, recommend me books, especially in the Discord. I'm trying to read 100 this year. And if I keep saying it, I have to be accountable. So <laughs> I, that's, you know what? that's called manifesting. And, that's, you know, good job. Hey, we're at 10 since, since the 1st of January. So I'll take it. Hey, you're doing um, good. That's really good progress. It's not even January's not even over yet. And you're already in the double digits. That's so good. I'll take it. Uh, Karen, where can they find you? All right, you guys can find me right here, of course, on Saturdays. So if you liked this type of content on Saturdays, we have basically two types of content that we do. One is this kind of thing where it's like a podcast. Um, a lot of times what we're talking about is a piece of media, like a book or TV show or something, but we do general topics like this sometimes too. It just kind of depends. The other thing that we do on Saturdays a lot of times is what I like to call our community days where we play a game together. And that actually is what we're doing next week. We are having a Stardew Valley community day. So if you're interested in that, please hop in our Discord, which I just linked a little bit ago, um, and get the farmer role. That will give you all of the information you need to join our farming co-op. Um, everybody's welcome. I have the mod to make it so we can have a jillion people in there. So if you're listening, that means you're invited. <laughs> It'll be fun. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that's what we're going to do next week. Um, so Sasha, if you haven't gotten Stardew yet, this is my me peer pressuring you. Get Stardew, play with us. <laughs> I think I own Stardew Valley. Like, I think I bought it. It's what, you know, but Oh, I didn't. I didn't ever play it. I've avoided it for so long. I don't even know how to play it. It's That's bad. okay. Landon didn't either. And now I she's obsessed. <laughs> and now I am obsessed if my computer wants to run it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's been the issue lately. So. Right. I'll, I'll, I'll double check to see if, if I own it since attempts i don't know what i'm supposed to do farm marry girls i guess yes. I can marry yes. girls that's a good you can thing. you can do that yeah there's a lot of really good girls in stardew too i think you'd particularly like um Haley and abigail Haley is um is mean and uh, mean to you and she's a pretty girl and then abigail is like the goth girl that likes to eat rocks and she's really funny oh boy i like how you've pigeonholed me into my types <laughs> Like you want someone who's like a little mean to you or you want some sort of rock eating freak, uh, which is correct. I actually feel like you want both. Both, both are the same girl. If you don't bully me like at least a tiny little bit sometimes or at least show that you're capable of bullying me, then I just think that our relationship will be me sitting on you all of the time. Yeah, I'm like, I'll, I'll be bored and I'll feel bad that I'm bullying you and you're not bullying me. Come on now. Yeah, it's, yeah that, that sounds accurate. bullying. <laughs> Here. Yep. Um, so we also stream on Thursdays. The Thursdays is where I mostly stream by myself. Right now, the main content that we're doing on Thursdays is my very first ever Nuzlocke run of Pokemon Leaf Green. I've never done a Nuzlocke before, so that's what we're doing. But actually, next Thursday, we're doing, we're taking a little break from that, doing something a little bit different. I am going to be playing two short games from friend of the show, Naomi Norbez. Um, he makes a lot of these like text-based interactive fiction type of games. We played a couple of them before. Um, both times the stories have been absolutely fabulous and we've really enjoyed them. So I'm looking forward to these. We're going to be playing Dead Account and Weird Grief, which are two short games that um, are companion games, as I understand it. They kind of go together, um, two different perspectives from uh, the same universe and similar topics. So that's what we're going to be doing next week. So really looking forward to that. Um, and then, of course, everything else for me is like exactly what you would expect from any content creator. You know, I have a YouTube channel, I have a Twitter, all of the things. You guys know how it works. If you go down in my about here on, on Twitch, like scroll down while I'm streaming, you'll see links to all the tons of other things. Um, but I don't do anything different than any other content creator. So you guys know how all that works. Um, and that's it. That's that's our show today. Um, I've got a fun raid for us. We're going to be raiding into uh, Ashley. I wanted to make sure, since this is our Caddy Girl stream, that we raid into one of my um, fellow female streamers. I'm going to make sure I'm spelling her name right. She has great content, and right now she's doing some React to something called My Story Animated, which I don't know what it is, but she looks like she's having a lot of fun doing it. So <laughs> that's what we're going. That's what we're going to see. So uh, if you are subscribed, get your raid emojis ready uh, to say hello to Ashley Amelia. Um, and that's it. That's our show. Thank you so much for coming, Sasha. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. And uh, don't forget, as always, of course, um, to make it a great day. And don't forget to be awesome. All right. Bye, guys. I will see bye. you next week or Thursday or in the Discord or wherever. Okay, bye!